Podcast. Presented by XFL2K.com. With your host, Tron Hawkins. Welcome to This is the XFL Podcast. I'm your host, Tron Hawkins. We're here. We've finished the last of the showcases. We've had St. Louis and we had Tampa. I'm going to start out with Tampa this episode. I'm um, just talking about a few players from each one, a few guys that you might have heard of or maybe forgot about. The first guy I want to talk about is Anthony Johnson, or Gut. Um, we missed him on the show a couple of times. Congratulations to him. Um, he's one of the first prospects I kind of showcased. Uh, I've talked to a family friend of his and talked to him a few times, and he actually got to try out for the XFL, and hopefully he gets signed. He's like the one person I kind of followed through the process, and I'm proud of him. I'm sure his family is too, so congratulations to Anthony Johnson for making it and even trying out for the showcase to even get noticed. And hopefully he makes it to fail and able to make a career out of it and able to support him, his family and his kid. Um, what a story he had. And uh, if you want to go back and listen in the archives, more about him, go check it out. Great story. Great kid. And he deserves uh, all the success that comes to him over the next couple of years. So the next guy I want to talk about is Austin Appleby. Um, a lot of people might have known him. Uh, he actually played some games for the Florida Gators. Um, I live in SEC country, so I know who he is. He tried it for Tampa, of course. A lot of regional flavor um, in these showcases. Um, he quarterbacked in high school at uh, Hoover High School in Canton, Ohio, North Canton, the birthplace of football. Uh, he played three sports, basketball, baseball, and football. During his freshman sophomore year, he served as the backup for the team as a junior in 2010. He was named starting quarterback by eight weeks of the season. He suffered a torn ACL. Despite his injury, Apple was invited to the ESPN Rise Elite 11 camp after qualifying at a regional camp at Ohio State University. Apple was named the best chalk best in chalk talk during the camp. Um, following the Elite 11 performance, Appleby's recruiting recruiting picked up. Then his first Power Conference scholarship. Offer from Louisville just a few days after Louisville offer. He was offered by Purdue, and he committed to the Board of Makers on June 29th, 2011. Coming out of high school, he's six foot five, six foot five, 228 pounds, um, and went a 4940. At Purdue, he was redshirted as a true freshman in 2012. 2013, he appeared in one game as a reserve. 2014, uh, Purdue had a quarterback position battle in fall practice, this time between Appleby and Danny Eatling and freshman David Blow. Uh, would have to be pushing hard for the starting spot over the entrance. Italy, he would fall just short, being named the backup on August 18th. Italy uh, led the Purdue to a 2-3 and three record uh, before Dan- Darrell Hazel turned to Appleby to start Purdue's sixth game against Illinois. Appleby led Purdue to a 20- 38-27 victory, Hazel's first Big Ten Conference victory. On October 25th, 2015, uh, Daryl Hazel named Appleby the starting quarterback for the opening game of the 2015 season. On September 22nd, 2015, it was announced that Appleby will, will be replaced as the starting quarterback in favor of Red Shirt David Blow. So he didn't really last but a couple weeks. Appleby returned to starting row when Blow was injured during the November 21st game against Iowa. Upon the concussion, conclusion of the season, Appleby was given his release to explore transfer options as a graduate student. On January 4th, 2016, uh, Appleby announced he has the season play his final year of college football at Florida, which is a big deal at the time, uh, under head coach Jim McElwain. Appleby committed, uh, competed with Luke Del Rio, which is Jack Del Rio's son, for the starting quarterback position and lost out to Del Rio. After an injury earlier in the season, Appleby started seven games for the Gators in 2016. So here's his stats. Uh, all time, he, started, uh, he played 25 games, 18 started. Uh, he went 6-12, 395 completions on 694 yards, 29 touchdowns, 26 picks. Um, he also ran uh, for nine touchdowns on, on 245 yards. He signed an undrafted free agent for the Cowboys. He got weighed. He was placed with Zach Desert. Desert. 2018, he signed with the San Antonio Commanders. On after November 27th, he was selected by uh, Orlando Apollos in the third round. Of the QB draft, he was back at the Garrett Gilbert until the league folded. And I think this the reason why I mentioned him is because he's a Florida boy. Shout out for Tamp in the Champions Showcase. Uh, he seems like a good kind of backup quarterback. Somebody that when somebody goes down with like a week or two, you can just kind of throw in there and just hope he maybe splits the game. Like if he, if he starts out two games, maybe I'll go one and one with him. I think he might be a good, decent backup quarterback in the league. And I ain't saying he's somebody to build a team around, 
but he's somebody that has a good insurance policy of one of the bigger name quarterbacks that we're hoping gets into the XFL. Um, the next guy I'm talking about is somebody that uh, my best friend hates. My best friend is a Washington Redskins fan. Um, when I mentioned this player to him that was trying out for the XFL, he said, that's disgusting. <laughs> and that is Matt Jones, uh, another Florida boy. He attended um, Armwood High School in Florida. He helped lead Armwood to a 15 0 record in the FHSAA Classic State Championship and number two rank in his senior year. A rushing for 896 yards and 10 touchdowns, despite missing four games. Also, holding in nine passes for 197 yards. He earned uh, honorable mention All State honors. He also competed in track and field. He was, um, he was rated a four-star recruit by Rivals.com and ranked 15th best running back in the class. That's in the country. Um, he committed to the University of Florida. Jones appeared in 12 games as a true freshman. In 2012, he rushed for 275 yards on 52 carries and three touchdowns. As a sophomore, Jones played only five games due to a torn meniscus. He finished, his, finished the year with 339 yards and two touchdowns. He returned to junior year in 2014. He had 166 carries for 100, uh, eight, I'm sorry, 817 yards and six rushing touchdowns. He entered the NFL draft after his junior season. I don't mean this in a bad way, but this guy seems like one of those that should have maybe played all four years in college. And I think you can say that more and more now in college football. There's players that should stay probably all four years and hopefully upgrade the draft class. But that's why a lot of these quarterbacks and stuff that comes in the NFL are failing. I mean, that's why we're looking at maybe Paxton Lynch or Geno Smith being a quarterback in the XFL and being a big star maybe because they didn't get enough – seasoning in college before they get thrown in the fire uh, frying pan and then fail. And I think a lot of these quarterbacks that's going to be in this league, like uh, Johnny Manziel or something, could have used that extra year I call seasoning before they get put in the fire on the grill that is the NFL. And hopefully the XFL will be the kind of, I don't want to say, you know, stove like the NFL will, but maybe maybe like a microwave. You know, maybe maybe the, the competition might not be as high as the NFL, and you give these guys the confidence back because a lot of these quarterbacks and running backs and players that are trying out for the XFL, they failed in the NFL because they lost their confidence. They lost their position battle or something. And then, you know, it's kind of like getting told you got fired. I mean, you're going to be, you know, down in your luck. So maybe this this XFL will reunite the passion of some of these players. He was selected 95th overall in 2015 draft. He signed a four-year contract on September 20, 2015 of his rookie year. He ran for 89 yards and a touchdown, which is his longest. Oh, ran 89 yards for a touchdown. I'm sorry, which was his longest run from scrimmage. Jones would run for career high 123 yards and two touchdowns that game. On November 15th against the Saints, Jones caught a pass and ran 78 yards for a touchdown, which is his first career receiving touchdown. He had finished with a career high 131 receiving yards. He flashed. On November 29th, on 15 against the Giants, he caught a pass and ran for 45 yards. He finished the rookie season with 144 carries, 490 rushing yards, and three touchdowns. He began the season two minutes as a starting running back after Alfred Morris left. And I remember this. Alfred Morris was a big deal in Washington. Uh, well, he's kind of disappeared now. But they let Alfred Morris walk thinking that they had a stud um, in this man. And he actually kind of fell off the planet. <laughs> Um, he suffered a knee injury um, on October 23rd, 2016, during a 20-17 to 17 loss to the Lions. He was placed by Ricky Robert Kelly for the following game and officially lost the starting position after Kelly performed well in Jones' absence. The following week, he was regulated the third string behind Kelly and Chris Thompson. He finished the 2016 season with 99 carries, 460 rushing yards, and three touchdowns. He was released in 2017. Again, he's shown potential, but the injuries and stuff kind of killed his momentum, and he kind of just... Just didn't regain it back. And all these players are like that. All these players had momentum, and it's gone. And sometimes when momentum leaves you, you can't get it back. Jones cleaned off flavors by the Colts. September 3rd, 2017, but he was released. Uh, I'm sorry. He was waived uh, six days later and put on the practice squad. He was promoted to the active roster in September 27th, 2017. But he was waived by the end of the season, but we signed two days later. He only carried the ball five carries, 14 yards in that season. He was released. And then he signed with Philadelphia and got released again September 1st, 2008. He's been out of a job since. So hopefully, again, he seems like a guy that would be a good backup in this league. A guy that could, like I said before, injury to your running back, he comes in. Maybe even a goal line back. Somebody you just kind of like a LeGarrette Blunt type. Somebody you just bring in at the one and just let them bulldoze over everybody for the easy touchdown. I think he's got that potential. Um, I think he's a lot better than what he showed in the NFL. He just needs a chance, and that's what this league's going to do is get people that might have been overlooked due to injury or due to just weird circumstances 
giving them a shot and a chance to make some money and maybe get back to the NFL one day and live their dream. The next guy is a very interesting name. That's B.J. Daniels. He played his college ball at South Florida. Uh, he was born and raised in Tallahassee, so it makes sense he was in Tampa. He graduated from Lincoln High School, where he wants to th- six touchdowns and 723 yards in the game against Dimply Prep. Uh, Daniels finished the 2019 season, 1,983 uh, yards passing, 772 yards rushing, and 23 total touchdowns. Daniels finished the 2019 season at South Florida with 1,983 passing yards, 772 rushing, and 23 total touchdowns. Daniels responded in his junior year with 32 uh, oh, 05 in total yards. Daniels was on his way to becoming an all-time yardage leader in Big East history when his senior season was cut short due to injury. Daniels ended his college career with 8,433 yards passing for 52 touchdowns, 2,068 yards rushing for another 25. Daniels achieved 10,501 total yards and 77 touchdowns at USF uh, and finished his career second on all-time the yardage leaders. Daniels finished his college career on USS rushing and passing leaderboards. He's also a member of the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. This kid was a beast at South Florida. Think about this. Did he even get that? Okay. USF wasn't in the Big East long when he got there. So the competition kind of jumped up when he got there, you know, when they moved to the to the Big East. Um, the kid was a stud. I mean, this kind of this is the kind of kid that I think could be the star of the league. Because he's going to be fun to watch. The only problem I have with him is, and we'll talk about it in a minute, he just ain't really played a lot since college. Um, his college career, he completed 649 yards passing on 1,132 attempts. Uh, that's 57.3 percentage. Um, 8,433 yards, 52 touchdowns, 39 picks. But the Russian, 526 attempts, 2,068 yards, and 25 touchdowns. That's impressive. And he won a Super Bowl as a wide receiver um, with the Seattle Seahawks. He was judged in the second round by the Niners, went to the Seahawks, put some wide receiver, didn't do nothing. Texans, Giants, Bears, Falcons, practice squad. Scott won Rough Riders, CFL didn't do nothing. He was placed on injury reserve in the AAF. He completed one pass for two of one pass and two attempts for seven yards in his career. He rushed six times for six yards. Caught two passes, eighteen yards in his pro career. So he didn't really do much after after um, college. So he's not really played a whole lot in seven years. So that's kind of the thing I'm wondering if maybe time's passed him by. But I think it's interesting. I think he's an interesting guy. If he, he still if he still got the wheels and the passion to play football, I think he would be a star in the league. And could be probably the most exciting person in the league. Kind of reminds me the way he looks and stuff. Kind of reminds me of Steve McNair. Steve McNair could throw the ball great, and he could run the ball. I, he kind of reminds me of him. So I think he could be a stud if given the chance. I wouldn't mind seeing him play uh, in Tampa, um, play for his home state, and let's see, you know, what the coaches can get out of him there. The last guy I'm going to talk about is a very, very interesting name, and could be a starter and a star. This kind of guy that people. I was talking about when they think about quarterbacks for the league. And one I kind of forgot about until I seen him pop up on XFL social media. And that's Ryan Mallett. Um, the interesting thing about him is, um, like in high school. In high school, he played in Texas, which is the, and ranked number two quarterback and number four overall player in, in the nation when he played high school in Texas. He played for Texas High School in Texarkana. Texas is a huge, huge part of uh, football state, as XFL 2K can uh, tell you. He completed 56% of his passes for 7,000. 879 yards, 72 touchdowns, 19 picks in his three years in high school. 72 to 19, that's impressive, even in high school. Uh, he started out in Michigan. He left Michigan because he did, he wanted to play for Lloyd Carr and not Rich Rodriguez. And Rich Rodriguez, you know, wanted to do the spread, read option kind of offense. So he went to Arkansas. Still at Arkansas. Uh, and in his collegiate career, he completed 562 passes on 595 attempts, 69 touchdowns, 24 picks. So he don't really make a lot of mistakes. He threw a lot of t- threw a lot of touchdowns in high school and college, and didn't throw you know a lot of picks to go with that. So he was he was a stud. He won the 2010 Premier Player of College Football Trophy winner, 2009 2010 All SEC Second Team. Uh, he won Offensive MVP of the Autos, uh, AutoZone Liberty Bowl, and he was Offensive Player of the Week for South Carolina and Mississippi State there. And this way, things got interesting. He was really he's he projected to be a uh, he was projected to be a first round talent, but he fell through the third round in the 2011 NFL draft for some reason. 
he was taken by the Patriots. And it was he when he was taken by the Patriots, it was under the assumption that he was gonna be the heir apparent to Tom Brady. Um, according to Michael Lombardi of the NFL Network, Patriots traded Mallet as the best quarterback available in the 2011 draft. Nevertheless, six other quarterbacks were taken before him, drawing comparisons to Tom Brady, who was seven times back chosen in 2000, though with the 199th pick. Mallet made his preseason debut in a route of the Jaguars. In 2012, the Patriots released incumbent backup Brian Hoyer. Mallet promoted second string behind May- Brady. Mallet dressed in each First eight games, and after the 45-7 blowout of the Rams in London, Mallet took his first snap in the NFL, completing one of the three passes, 17 yards. He, he's kind of picked up blowout work. 2013, he was behind Brady again ahead of Tim Tebow. So Mallet was only back up. Mallet was traded to the Texans, though, for a conventional six-round pick. He would be the Texans' primary backup to another fifth when Mallet was named starting quarterback, um, replacing Ryan Fitzpatrick. During week 11 to 14 season, Mallet started his first game against Cleveland Browns. He threw one touchdown past J.J. Watt. He went 20 or 30 with um, two touchdowns. But Mallet tore his pick and horror almost against the Bengals in this season. Mallet returned to them 15 for the starting quarterback position against former teammate Brian Hoyer. Ended up losing the competition to Hoyer. They, the day after the announcement, Mallet missed the following day's practice, leading some believe he disagreed with the decision. Mallet apologized and told head coach that he missed practice due to oversleeping. After that, though, he just kept getting benched. Texans released him October 27, 2015. He didn't really oversleep. I think he was just pissed off about the decision. He kind of he kind of got immature about the whole situation. In the wake of quarterback Matt Schaub suffering an injury following Joe Flacco's own in the season-ending injury, Mallet signed with the Ravens December 25, 2015. He threw a career-high 274 yards, leading the Ravens to a 2017 upset victory of the Steelers. On his seventh career start after Jimmy Clausen was benched, talking about another bust. He would promptly get a new career high a following week to an 292 yard passing and a loss of the Bengals. Following Siles returning to Atlanta to be Matt Ryan's backup, Clawson retiring from the NFL. Uh, Mallet became Flacco's backup in 2016, appearing in four games. He completed three or six passes. Mallet signed a one year contract after Flacco's of concussion. Um, Mallet ended the game, three or seven passes, 21 yard, or 20 yards, and a touchdown as Miami won 40 to 0. He kind of just didn't map, map up work. He only had uh, nine touchdowns and ten picks in his career. This is a guy who had some off-the-field stuff going on with him, like the oversleeping and just kind of been insubordinate. But if he can straighten his life out and get back to where he was, supposed to be the heir apparent to the greatest quarterback of all time, this guy could be a star in the league. And um, I see him maybe being a, a big deal. I don't know, maybe St. Louis. You know, maybe St. Louis. Seattle with Zorn. I can see him being a, a, a star up there. And uh, we'll see We'll see what happens in the draft. So the first guy I'm going to talk about from St. Louis is Luis Perez. I mean, a lot of you know him from the San Antonio Command. Or he got signed by the San Antonio Commanders uh, out of the area, but he ended up playing um, the judge in the first round, fifth overall by the moment in iron. Uh, uh, he got drafted, you know, let me tell you the quarterbacks he got drafted above in the area draft. It was kind of crazy because everybody was like, well, Luis Perez? He got drafted um, above Trevor Knott, Garrett Gilbert, Blake Sims, uh, Matt Sims, B.J. Daniels, which we talked about earlier, Hackenberg, Marquise Williams, who we talked about on the episode before, Brandon Silvers, um, Scott Tozine, Mettenberger. So he got drafted above all those guys, and everybody was like, wow, he he might be legit then. And he was the first quarterback actually taken. The other ones were protected. In college, um, he played for Southwestern College. Um, and Texas A&M Commerce. So he didn't play for a huge school. At Southwestern College, he threw for 23 touchdowns and four picks in two years. At Texas A&M Commerce, he threw for 78 touchdowns and 16 picks. He was national champion, uh, Harlan Hill Trophy Award, two-time All-Lone Star Conference um, first team. Uh, Don Hanson, the honorable mention All-American, second-team All-American, two-time first-team All-American, J.W. Rollins Award as the Long Conference Offensive Player of the Year, or Long Star Conference's Player of the Year. Uh, Associated Press, first team All American. Voted best returning quarterback in Division II football. Then he played, got to play for Birmingham. He threw five touchdowns, six picks for Birmingham. He seems like the top quarterback that the XFL could need. I mean, he was obviously great in college. His career in college, he threw for 10,000 yards between both schools. Um, threw for over 100 touchdowns and only 20 picks in college. He's a guy, I think, like in L.A., that if you put a good defense behind him like Birmingham had, um, he won't lose the game for you. He'll win it majority of the time. 
Um, Luis Perez, I think, is one of the quarterbacks that all of us that watched AEF or knew what it was um, kind of went, hey, he'd be a good pickup for the XFL. And I, I agree. Um, he's a small school guy, but somebody seen some in him to pick him over those other quarterbacks. And I think somebody might see some in him in the XFL too. Maybe be a backup like I've been talking about, about B.J. Daniels and or about the other quarterbacks. Not be a backup until somebody gets hurt and then comes in and takes over the starting job and never gets it back. Watch out for Luis Perez uh, in the XFL come 2020. So the next guy I'm going to talk about is a pretty big name, uh, Connor Cook. Um, Connor Cook was a big deal at Michigan State. He's quarterback of the year. Young United's doing the Armour Award winner. First team Big Ten there. Uh, two-time Big Ten champion. Two-time uh, Big Ten championship game MVP. Uh, 2014 Rose Bowl champion, 2014 Rose Bowl champion uh, MVP, and 2015 Cotton Bowl Classic champion. Upon rolling, enrolling at Michigan State, Cook was registered his freshman year and spent 2012 season as a backup to Andrew Maxwell. At two years bench, Connor led the team to the 2012 Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl, completing four of 11 passes, 47 yards, and touchdown. He appeared in three games, competing, completing nine of 17 passes for 94 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. And in 2013, as the backup to Maxwell again, after Maxwell struggled, Cook took over as the starter. As of the first game, he remained the starter all year. He led Michigan State to an upset 34-24 victory over Ohio State. He was named MVP after throwing 304 yards and three picks. He led the Spartans to a 24-20 victory over Stanford in 2014 Rose Bowl. He was named offensive MVP after throwing for 322 yards and two touchdowns. Cook finished the season 2007 Two two thousand seven hundred fifty five yards passing and twenty two picks. Well, it's not bad. Cause Michigan's really a run, kind of like a run first school. But he was the first like really good quarterback coming from there in a while. As a junior, down fourteen, Cook passed for th- thirty two hundred fourteen yards, twenty four pit or uh, twenty four touchdowns. Excuse me. He led the Spartans two thousand fifteen Cotton Bowl, where they uh, defeated the higher ranked Baylor Bears forty two forty one. I remember that game. They had to come back and win that game. Um, but there's there's their first New Year's Bowl win. Uh, well, that back to back New Year's Bowl wins in a while. His senior year, Cook led Spartans to a 16-13 win over the the Iowa uh, Hawkeyes in the Big Ten Championship game. It was named MVP again. They end up earning a spot in the college football playoff and got just blew out of the water by Alabama, uh, like everybody else did. They got beat 38 to nothing. That was the year that both um, playoff games were just blowouts. I mean, it was bad. It was horrible. They just blew him out of the water. Clemson blew out, I think, Washington as well. Um, no, wait, I'm in Alabama next year. Anyway, both of them were just blowouts, and Alabama just destroyed them. Um, like a lot of people thought they would. Cook finished the season with 30, 30, 3,131 yards passing, 24 touchdowns. Uh, his finished career with 71 touchdowns, 22 picks, so not horrible, um, and three rushing touchdowns on top of that. A lot of people, I think, thought he might be a, a decent quarterback in the NFL, maybe like a good backup, but he really didn't do nothing. He got drafted by the Raiders, didn't see no action. He was just behind, you know, Carr. He was behind Matt McGloin at one point. He he only played one game in the NFL, 14-21 passing, touchdown on a pick. So and he didn't play the whole 2017 season. 2016, like I said, he just – the, the that game – uh, he did start a postseason game in 2016. Um, they got beat because he threw three picks um, against the Texans. Connor Cook, you know, he kind of had a bad situation. He kind of just came in and just kind of flat out just kind of didn't get the NFL system, I don't think. Um, he was third string. He used to – he used to be a backup, but there for a while he was a rock star at Michigan. He kind of just didn't know what to do once he got the NFL. Then his one of his, his second ever start – uh, first ever start, he was in a playoff game and just got demolished on a big stage. I mean, what do you expect going to happen? You're playing a good defense in the Texans and you're throwing a new kid out there. At, and that's the year Raiders had a good year and then Carr got hurt. So all the world, you know, all the pressure was on him and he didn't live up to it. So hopefully in the next NFL, he gets a second shot. Um, he might be a backup um, to a big star or he somebody might see some in him and say, you know what, we're going to give you a chance, kid. Um, and see if he can kind of get that Michigan State magic back, which he could. He was a, he was a stud at Michigan State, but maybe the XFL kind of re- reinvigorate uh, the stud in him that might have got destroyed in Oakland, which a lot of people's careers get destroyed in Oakland. So maybe uh, the XFL will be the kind of rehab that he needs. So the next guy is a guy I think a lot of people forgot about, and that is Jonas Gray. Now I bet you're wondering, man, where have I heard that name before? I'm just going to kind of skip ahead to this. Uh, he went to um, 
He went to Miss uh, uh, Notre Dame. He was ranked the fourth best running back in his prospect class, four star recruit. He got signed by the Patriots. Um, the, he was signed to the end January 10th, 2014. Um, he got cut, but uh, he got signed back on October 16, 2014. This is where it got tricky, and I remember this game like it was yesterday. On November 16, 2014, Gray rushed for 201 yards and a franchise record four touchdowns. Nobody seen it coming. People were like, who's Jonas Gray? Uh, in his fourth career NFL game, leading the New England Patriots to a 42-20 win over the host Colts. Gray was the first NFL running back since 1921 to score four touchdowns in a game after ending the game with zero touchdowns in his career. The first running back in the Super Bowl era to count for more than 25% of rushing touchdowns for 10 in a week with at least 10 games. There's only 10 rushing touchdowns that week. He scored four. <laughs> a correction to the official stats, removing, removing a two-yard loss that was negated by a 15-yard face mask. Made his final stats game 201 yards and 37 carries. He scored 24 total points in the game, which was tied with Marshawn Lynch by the most by any player in a single game to the unfortunate season. Gray would, however, only carry 91 more, uh, would only record 91 more total yards and was inactive for the Patriots for the Patriots' remaining nine games, including the team's Super Bowl 49 win. Gray finished the season with 89 carries, 412 yards, and five touchdowns. He was released September 5th the next year. What happened was, I think he was late like a team meeting or something, and you know how Belichick is. He kind of just sat him, and he never really did anything after that. He had that one big game. That's what people remember him for. And then after that, he got trouble. Got on Belichick's shit list and was never seen from him again until his last week in St. Louis. I think the kid might be a stud. He's still young. I think he's like 29. Why not give him a chance? You know, if he can if he can score four touchdowns in the NFL game, what can he do in the XFL? I think he'd be a good running back in the XFL. And I think we might hear his name a little bit more uh, come 2020. So keep an eye out on Jonas Gray. I know that a lot of people forgot about that game. But go watch highlights of it. He ran like a crazy person. I mean, sure, the Colts... Offense or defense back then was awful. Uh, most time it was, but 200 yards and four touchdowns in a NFL game is about impossible. So the kid's got some talent there, no matter what defense you're going against. So keep an eye on him um, come next year. The last guy I'm going to talk about is a polarizing guy, um, and we all know who it is. It's the one guy from the AAF. Everybody's like, I bet he's going to be in the XFL, and here he is, the leading, <laughs> the leading touchdown getter in the AAF. Trent Richardson. This guy was um, this guy was kind of interesting. You know, he won he he won the Heisman. So this oh, I'm sorry, he was a Heisman finalist. I apologize. He's a two-time BCS national champion, a Heisman Trophy finalist, 2011. I got him and Mark Ingram and I think Derrick Henry mixed up. You know what I mean? American Doak Walker Award winner, two SEC Offensive Player of the Year, two-time First Team All SEC, 2010 2011 SEC champion. SEC All Freshman Team, USA Today High School All American. He was a stud coming out of uh, Pensacola. Of course, he went to Alabama, backed up Richardson and and, and Glenn Coffey. Alabama just has all the running backs. He ended up tying Sean Alexander with six consecutive hundred yard rushing games, and he scored two or more touchdowns in seven games his 2011 season. Um, he had seven six hundred and seventy nine rushing yards, breaking Mark Ingram, Ingram's record for most rushing yards in a season. With, and 21 rushing touchdowns. 21 rushing touchdowns that year was also an SEC running back record. He had 338 yards receiving with three touchdowns, making his season total of 24, which tied Sean Alexander's SEC record. And a lot of people was comparing him to MVP Sean Alexander. Um, while Alabama, he had um, 3,243 rushing yards, 35 touchdowns, um, and he uh, also did kick returns. Had a kick return touchdown, seven receiving touchdowns, thirty-five rushing touchdowns. He got drafted uh, with the third overall pick by the Cleveland Browns, two thousand eleven draft. I'm sorry, two thousand twelve draft. Um, and Bill Polian called him one of the three surefire thing, a sure thing player, two thousand twelve draft. He got drafted. Um, Jim Jim Brown um, loved him. <laughs> Um, Richardson rushed for 42 yards and two touchdowns in Week 13 against the Chiefs. Um, he he was a stud. Um, he he broke Jim Brown's rookie record of, or tied Jim Brown's franchise rookie record of nine touchdowns. And going to 2013 season, a lot of people projected him to be the next big thing and helping Cleveland turn it around. His year in Cleveland that year, 
he had 950 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns. So he broke Jim Brown's record. Um, he had 51 catches for 30 or 367 yards and one touchdown. So the kid was a stud. I mean, he was going to, you know, he almost had 1,000 yards. He broke a franchise record for touchdowns for Ricky. He was going to be a stud. And then he uh, got traded. He got traded surprisingly a couple weeks into the 2013 season to the Colts, and he was never the same. Um, he kept signing with teams, signing with the CFL, and ended up in the AAF. Richardson signed with the Birmingham Iron um, in 2019, or for the 2019 season. And here's the thing. If you go watch videos of him, and I, I suggest you do, uh, he always missed holes in the NFL. Like, he was always just missing the hole. He would run right into the fenders, or he'd get two or three yards at a time and just kind of mysteriously just stop. So his NFL career, he had 2,000 and 32 rushing yards with 950 that comes right here. 17 touchdowns. 11 that come in his rookie year. He had uh, 912 yards receiving. 367 come in his rookie year. Uh, on 113 receptions. In the CFL, he, he only had 259 rushing yards and 48 attempts and two touchdowns. Birmingham, though, he had uh, 11 touchdowns in eight games for 366 yards. This is the guy that's going to be a starting running back in the in the XFL. This is the kind of guy they're looking for. Somebody that has history. Somebody that can run the ball, um, and somebody that is a bulldozer, and I see him being a starter in this league, one, on name recognition, and two, he's done it before. He's done it before in the NFL, um, even though before he got traded. I think if the Browns never traded him, he'd probably still be a really good backup NFL running back. But after they traded him, he's like, okay, y'all don't want me anymore. Or the Browns seen something in the tape going, okay, this guy's going to be a bust. Let's get a first-round pick for him from the Colts. Which, of course, knowing the Browns, they didn't they didn't do nothing with that first round pick. But he's done it before in the NFL. When he got traded, I think his confidence got shook, which is the theme of a lot of these players. And he kind of just like, eh, I don't care anymore. He's going to be a goal line back that's going to bulldoze and just get you touchdowns. Think about this. Say if your team's tied in the XFL and they, with no time left. You're on the one, or two-yard line going for one-point conversion. What are you going to do? Run it with Trent Richardson, let him bulldoze, you win the game. He's going to be that type of back. I think these kind of players in the XFL is going to be a thing where they're situational on like the conversions. Hand it to Trent Richardson, let him bulldoze and get you a couple points or even a touchdown. Trent Richardson may be the best running back come 2020 on touchdowns alone. Thank you for joining me on this episode. Check out my Twitter page and Facebook page at XFL Podcast. Check out XFL2K.com. He does articles almost every day, breaking news, this week in XFL, every Friday, wonderful show. Check out XFL board and just just enjoy the community. Um, that is the XFL community. Thank you and have a good night.